every Wednesday at 12 to 12.30 Eastern Time or sign up for updates on Mike's mailing list at salessensesolutions.com. Mike appreciates you listening and wishes you good luck on your next sales call. Well, welcome. I'm Mike Krause with uh, Sales Sense Reality Talk Show. I'm really excited to have Bob Yurichuk here uh, as our guest today. He's an internationally renowned velocity selling specialist. For the last 15 years, he has worked with Fortune 500 companies and mid-sized businesses to inspire, empower, and add sales velocity to their bottom line. As the Canadian-based founder, International Bob Urichuk Management, and you can be reached at bobu.com. So without further ado, Bob, how are you this afternoon? Excellent, Mike. How about yourself? Oh, good. Thanks for asking. I appreciate that. Um, I would tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself and your background, especially when it comes to selling, because that's uh, my passion. So tell them a little bit more about yourself. Well, it's also my passion, Mike. Um, I was, I guess the best place to start is I was born in a small family business and uh, six kids. And all the six kids got into the operational side of the business where I was the only one that ever got involved in marketing and sales. That led me um, into, you know, sales as I grew up. And I was running a business at age 11. Time I was 18, I was uh, doing door-to-door sales, very successful at it. And over the years, I got into the corporate world and conducted all kinds of sales. But I guess the real point came uh, at age 30. I had a major business failure, and it was a major setback in my life financially, and I went back into the corporate world. And when I went back into the corporate world, I asked myself a question. Bob, why are you going to work? Now, I asked this question all over the word, world, Mike. And what answer do you think I get when I ask people, why do you go to work? Why do I go what to answer work? Do you, yeah, why do you go to work? What answer do you think I would get from people all over the world when I ask that question? Oh, I love this conversation. Uh, yes, yeah, so what the answer I think that the most people would say is I go to work to pay my bills or money. Okay, it's money. That's the answer. And then what I do is I teach them a technique that I teach business leaders and uh, business owners and, of course, uh, salespeople all over the world. And I call this technique the rule of three plus. Even to yourself, you think you're telling yourself the truth on the first answer, but you never are. In sales and in, in this world, in business, we have to get the clarity to the truth. Our job as salespeople is to diagnose people's needs and to help them to discover the real truth of what their real true need is. So we ask the question, why do you go to work? People will say money. Then what we do is we question the answer. Money to do what? then they'll say to pay our bills and have a certain lifestyle. And the more we question it, the more we realize that people really go to work because they have a dream. You see, work is nothing but a stepping stone to helping you get where you want to go. The problem is, is most people never take the time to find out and determine where they want to go. So when I did that at age 30, I said, okay, well, this is my dream. I want to be a professional speaker, trainer, author. Um, I'm going to give myself 15 years to clean up this debt. I'll work here for 15 years. At the end of 15 years, one of two things is going to happen. I'm going to be at this senior position in the company, and if I am, I will stay and I will retire from it with an index pension plan. However, at age 45, if I'm not that, I'm going to go out, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to become an international uh, professional speaker, trainer, uh, etc., and or author. And what I did then is I used my job to help me gain the experience, the knowledge, and basically help me get to where I wanted to go. I used my job as a stepping stone to help me get there. So I performed well for them, always got high appraisals. But what I also did is I took control of my own career path. The first thing I did is I had I created an owner's mentality. My job, my position was my business. Nobody should know it better than me. I became an expert in every job that I held. It was my business, and with that owner's mentality, I was never reactive. I was always proactive. I was one step ahead all the time, and that really gave me get great benefits. So I maneuvered myself into marketing, learned a lot about mass marketing, made a lot of errors, errors that I could not afford when I was in business by myself. From that, I moved myself into franchising. I'm one to sell a franchise not, or create a franchise, not buy a franchise. So I've learned a ton about franchising. And then an opportunity came up in the corporation where they had uh, just over 600 salespeople and they, they were creating a sales training department. I applied for the job and unfortunately I came in too late. Uh, a good friend of mine already secured it. So I went and saw him and he said, Bob, I've got 50 resumes in my drawer. Um, you tell me, which territory do you want? What topics do you want? 
I picked at that time Western Canada and I also picked uh, sales, motivation and leadership. He gave me an opportunity. He said, Bob, you got one year. Do whatever you can, but find us a sales training program that we could use. So for in one year, I attended over 40 of the world's top sales training programs. Many of them were traditional. Many of them I didn't even stay half a day. But however, some of them were really interesting. So knowing where I was going, I used this as an opportunity to gather best practices. From these best practices, I created the Velocity Selling System. And by the way, from there, um, from sales training, I moved into the Learning Institute. They gave me a diploma in adult learning, uh, became a certified master trainer, and I would, tr I would go out, get the programs, be certified on them, and then in turn, I would train 90 trainers to deliver the training to up to 55,000 employees. And that was when I was turning 45. I sent in a note, it's time. Um, you know, I've decided to leave, managed to negotiate a bio package, and immediately started my business. Now, I could have started my business in my backyard. However, there is a saying that you cannot profit in your backyard. And as you know, profit is spelt in two different ways, P-R-O-F-I-T and P-H-O-R-E-T, profit. You see what I'm saying from speaking? And I decided that what I was going to do, a big objective of mine was to travel the world and make a difference in the world, particularly in the reputation of sales professionals. As you know, this profession does not have the best of reputations. And uh, quite often uh, when I do training programs, I'll ask people to play a little game with me. Pretend you're all buyers. We're going to play the game called Password. I'm going to give you a word, and I want you to tell me what thoughts come to mind. And then as soon as I say a salesperson, well, the, ner the, na the words that come up are usually a negative connotation. Money hungry, commission oriented, self-centered about the company, about the product, fancy dressers, smooth talkers, these kind of words. And that's the kind of reputation that we do not want in this profession. I believe that sales is by far the most important professions of all professions in the world. Why? Because without sales, you have no transactions. Without transactions, you have no revenue. Without revenue, organizations would not exist and no one would have a job. The world revolves around sales. Would you not agree, Mike? Oh, I 100% agree with you, Bob, wholeheartedly. And that's one of my passions is to change the image of selling long term is because I think it's the best thing out there. And interesting enough, I was a professor at um, a university last spring, and I asked the first day of class, what is your first impression of sales? And it was all, like you would say, negative connotations, used car yeah. salesmen, et cetera, et cetera. And it's sad because the, the good salespeople like you and um, myself have to put up with the other 90% that are kind of making a bad name or image for us. And um, that's very interesting. And not only that, bring that up. yeah, and not only that, a lot of people want to avoid getting anywhere near sales. You take a look at professionals, yeah. consultants, doctors, lawyers, they're all sales. And, you know, there's a lot of programs out there selling skills for non-selling professionals. Yet these people don't ever want to be associated with sales because of that negative connotation that's attached to that. So what I do is I teach the opposite of sales. I don't teach selling skills. I teach how to attract, engage, and empower buyers to buy. Nobody likes to be sold. Everybody likes to buy. So what I teach are non-traditional techniques to basically, you know, don't go out chasing customers. There's other ways of attracting them. So we look at the, rather than a push strategy, we look at a pull strategy and attract people to us, which leads us to getting more qualified leads. And of course, I engage them. I don't tell them what I'm about or what my company's all about. It's all about the buyer. You are the most important person in the world, but when you have a buyer in front of you, they are the most important person. So we need to engage them. We need to understand them. We need to make them comfortable. We need to know what they're really looking for, and we need to question them to a point where we help them discover their needs for themselves. But then we continue with a line of questioning where they actually buy from us. We don't have to sell them, they will buy from us. And that's what's really quite unique and different about the, the process that I've taken. Now, when I started my business, I went to the other end of the world and I started in Singapore. And I've used Singapore for the last 15 years as my hub for Asia. Dubai is my hub for the Middle East and I travel through Europe and uh, China en route to these locations and quite often do a lot of work in those areas as well. Now, I'm based in Ottawa, Canada, Canada's capital, and of course I do America from here as well. 
So it's been an interesting journey, and I've managed to, uh, well, I've managed to get into and, and visit and train in over 30 countries in the world and over 30 cities. And I'm, I'm most thankful for the accomplishments I've made to date. Actually, I've surpassed all my own expectations and all my dreams. Absolutely, Bob. And I love how you stated and how you kicked off the conversation with, you, you know, people don't take that time to plan their life. Um, yeah, well, that's number one. <laughs> you, you know, they just get into these ruts, into these life. And I was in the same rut as you. I spent 12 years in corporate selling, and I said, you know, if not now, when? And yeah. it's been the best thing, decision I've ever met, excuse me, done. But as you know, it's also very challenging having your own name, but it's very rewarding. Um, Yes. There's no question about that. I wish more people would focus on the end in mind um, because you do become your thoughts. I'm a big believer in that visualization um, and then, yeah. well, now the popular law of attraction. Um, but um, well, you see, I'm, I'm fast. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, I was just saying, when I was 22 years old, I called into work sick and I dedicated 24 hours to myself. And during that 24 hours, I sat down at my dining room table and I asked myself, Bob, what do you want to be? What do you want to do? What do you want to have? Then I said, hey, let's have some fun with this. Let's pretend nothing's impossible. No barriers, no limitations. There is one rule, though. You have to write it down. And if it's not written down, it'll never happen. So I wrote, 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 wrote. I filled up a pad of paper. I slept on it, added a few more as I woke up in the morning. I uh, went to work. That morning, I took that book and I said, this is all I want out of life. The funny thing is, after about six months, I lost that book. Eighteen years later, as we move into our final dream home, I find that book in the move. And as I'm going through reading it, believe it or not, I was saying, geez, been there, done that, haven't done this yet, but it's still part of my plan. And that one day of 24 hours dedication, writing it all out, made the biggest difference in my life. Now, that also led me into writing my first book, which is called Disciplined for Life. You are the author of your future. And what I did is created a book that was interactive, sharing my stories and asking people questions so that they can discover themselves from the inside out, so they can determine their true level of success, what they want to do, how to do it, when to do it, create the action plans, and I provide them with the tools so that they can monitor to themselves on a daily basis to live the life of their dreams. As a matter of fact, Mike, as a, as a gift to anybody of your audience members, they can go to the website disciplinedforlife.com. That's discipline ending with a D, for life.com. And they could download the first three chapters free of charge. Oh, well, thank you. That's very nice to you. Yeah, share with my listeners. I appreciate that. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated by your white paper here um, off your website, BobU.com. Can you speak yes. to that a little bit more? Because I, I'm a big believer in what you've stated here. Traditional and consultative selling methods no longer work. Um, talk, talk about the new economy of buyers. That's the title of your white paper. Okay. Well, as the recession came in, um, you know, things slowed down a little bit. And, I, and what I did is I decided to take some time to reflect and ask myself, what, what can, how can I help people the most, uh, particularly sales professionals, business owners, etc.? And so I sat down and I started thinking about it. And I realized uh, a long time ago that traditional and consultative selling, does no, these methods no longer work. And then I realized we also have a new economy of buyers out there. And I started to dissect it. And again, I used the, the rule of three plus myself. You know, like, why are these buyers different? What has happened? And I questioned the answers, and I got to some, some interesting facts. First of all, when you go back in time, let's face it. Um, salespeople are by far the most knowledgeable people in any organization. They know features, benefits. They know uh, discounts. They know pricing. They know uh, comp competitive practices. They know, they know it all. And when you ask a salesperson a question, what do they do? They what answer they, that. They, yeah. you know, no, when you ask any salesperson, sorry, when you ask a salesperson a question, what do they do? They answer the question. Would you agree? Yes, always. And it's, yes, so I'll continue. Okay, so what's happened here now is we as salespeople talk so much that we have educated buyers on how we sell. And what buyers have done in turn is they've created a system to protect themselves against salespeople. Mm -hmm. And I call this the buyer system. And we could run through it quickly if you like. Uh, basically, when you, let's see, I, I always like to use a scenario when we do this because my whole method of instruction is self-discovery. 
Uh, when I use self-discovery, you come up with the answer, you own the answer, and it sticks with you forever. When you, let's say, Michael, you wanted to go in and buy yourself a dress shirt, white, and you're willing to pay uh, $50 for it. You walk into the store. Now, I know you're, I realize you're male. You might give me a different bit of an answer, but you walk into a store, salesperson comes up to you, and what do they usually say to you? What do they and I'm only say? using, uh, yeah, what would a salesperson usually say to you as you walk into a retail outlet? What are you looking for? Yeah, or how can I help you? Yeah. And what do you use the answer? Yeah, how can I help you? And what do you usually answer? I usually answer just looking. You got it. You see, this is the answer that everyone comes. I'm using just this retail example just to get the message across. It, it works in business to business as well. The first step of the buyer system is that we will always mislead the salesperson as a buyer. Why do we mislead them? Because we don't, have, we don't feel comfortable with them. We don't trust them. We know they're going to sell us something. We know that they may even lie to us. So we protect ourselves, so we mislead them right off the bat. Step number two, we want to know as much as the salesperson knows, but we don't want to pay for it. We call this step free consulting. You find the shirt you want, you call the salesperson over, you ask them all kinds of questions, they answer all your questions. Then the third step comes along. You know, you've got all the information you want now, what do you tell the salesperson? Um, I'll think about it, I'll get back to you. And of course, as a buyer, you never get back to the salesperson. But some salespeople are good. They get your name, your telephone number, your email address. So what do they do? They call you. You as a buyer, do you take their calls? No. Do you reply to their voicemail? No. Do you reply to their emails? No. What you do is you hide. So the four steps of the buying system is they will mislead salespeople. They will try to get as free, as much free consulting as they possibly can. They will mislead you again. And in the end, they will hide from you. And this is the way buyers are buying. And what's happened through the reception, recession is you've got more educated buyers. Buyers know our approaches. And if we don't start to change our behaviors and the way we treat buyers, we're not going to get any further. You have to realize that in the new economy of buyers, it is not about you, the salesperson. It is not about the products you are selling. And it is not about the company you represent. The first thing that has to happen is the buyer has to buy you as an individual as a human being. So your objective is no longer to sell a product. Your objective is to make a friend. As you know, people buy from people, people they like, people they know, people they trust. If you want to buy a car and don't know anyone selling cars, you will ask one of your friends that you trust to refer you to someone that they may know, and hence the process goes. Our job in sales is really to make more friends. The more friends we have, the bigger our network. The bigger our network, the bigger our net worth. Everything that you will do in life will come from your network. And that's why it's so important to always be on the lookout and making friends, creating relationships, because it's a lot easier to sell when you have a relationship. If there's no relationship, if there's no interest in the other person, they will find reason to go elsewhere and deal with somebody that makes them feel more comfortable and that understands them. Absolutely. So, well, Absolutely. Yeah. So one of the things we, we discussed in this paper, The New Economy of Buyers, is how buyers have been educated, what buyers are looking for, the four universal needs of buyers, and of course, how you could do things differently that can make that difference. And it's free of charge. And once you download the uh, white paper, there's another document, the uh, well, it's coaching guide number one on the velocity selling system to help you understand what you can do a little further. And we also put out a weekly, uh, we call it a velocity selling minute, a weekly minute full of tips on, uh, and blogs and, and tips on sales, motivation, and leadership. Sure. So anybody can subscribe to that. So um, besides you know, obviously being, and these are obvious things to yourself and, and myself here on the line, but I find when I'm doing the one-on-one -on -one coaching and the training that everyone nods their head in the audience, oh, yes, I'm a good listener, yes, I try to make friends, but... <laughs> It, 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 it's like common sense, right? That's why I came up with sales sense. It's common sense. <laughs> Very few people But, but do Mike, this. yeah, Mike, let me share with you what somebody said to me just yesterday, one of my neighbors. I thought this was a great quote. Common sense is not so common. Yeah, absolutely. Voltaire, yeah, said that. And that's, <laughs> my, my point is that, you know, we get these nods and we get everything going and, and we do the coaching, and they're all giddy up. And then they, the salesperson still goes in there and goes, here's my brochure. Let me tell you why I'm the best. 
How yeah. in your professional training experience have you made that mind shift in people? They know that they're doing it wrong, but they ice up or they freeze, they get stage fright when it becomes live time. Have you seen guess, anything else? You know, go ahead. Well, what I've done in, in my own sessions is, well, number one, we always do in-class role plays. That's one thing. Number two, um, I make it very clear. Uh, I ask the question, did you learn how to ride a bicycle in a seminar? And the answer, obviously, is no. You learned it in the, on the road, in the street, and you had courage. I also make them feel comfortable with failing because failing leads to a lesson learned. Give yourself permission to fail so that you can learn and grow from it. So what I do is we do role plays in class, but I go a step further. I, don't, I will never teach. I, I don't ever train salespeople alone unless I can also train sales management because sales management has to walk the talk. They have to demonstrate it and they have to provide ongoing coaching. Otherwise, the program is not going to work. So what I do is, not only do they try it in class and role plays, we sometimes go out in the real world and we do like one-on-one -on -one ob observation and coaching on the floor or in a client meeting. I've often gone in as, as a newbie, a newbie sales rep, and I just sit back and take notes. Oh, don't mind, Bob, he's just new to our company, he's just going to be observing. And then what we do, of course, after the sales call is we debrief. What went well, what didn't go so well, what would you do differently? And of course, there's four things that you're always looking at from a sales call. And we call these the four positive outcomes of the sales call. One is a yes. Obviously, you made a sale. That is a good thing. Another positive outcome is no. They are not qualified. There's no sense chasing this any further. Now, a no is a positive outcome. Why would you want to waste your time on someone that's not qualified? The third one is if you didn't get a yes, you didn't get a no, you strive for what we call a clear future. It's not a maybe. A clear future is knowing exactly what's going to happen next, that you're going to get together next Tuesday and finalize this. So you're going to do a, a presentation next Tuesday, but you always have a clear future. If you didn't get one, two, or three, you have failed. And what happens when you fail? You get a lesson learned. So what you do is you always debrief yourself after a call, and if you have a buddy, you could debrief with the buddy, and this would help each other reinforce it. When you become accountable to somebody and you have ongoing coaching and ongoing training, that's what makes the real difference. Absolutely. And so many organizations, I'm sure you've seen these stats out there, they do like 87% have never been through a formalized sales training. I find that remarkable. But it's also that 87% that are putting the name out there as a sales professional in a bad light. Yes. Well, you see what's happening. A lot of organizations are hiring salespeople because they have sales experience and they feel they don't need sales training. And that's a, that's a big assumption and it can be a big mistake. And when you have your team uh, all using different techniques and different slants without any commonality, it's pretty hard to discuss and debrief and move forward on it or to even train them in the right way. And, this is, and the other big challenge is because my programs are so radically different, they have to unlearn first to relearn. So I can't tell them. I have to engage them in the process so they actually see how the customers are reacting and actually see that what they're doing is not beneficial and it's actually harmful, not only to them, but to the reputation of the sales professional as well. Absolutely. And there's a lot of bad, can't teach an old dog new tricks, but uh, I guess uh, we try as hard as we can. Um, well, we try. We exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of people out there that are doing a lot of uh, damage for the rest of us. There's no no point about that. What what came up with uh, the velocity selling? Uh, tell 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 the listeners more about what that means. What does that mean? Well, one of the biggest pains we have found in the market, um, you know, when you when you uh, try to describe a service, you got to look at what are your clients' problems, what are their pains, what we have found in the last couple of years. Now. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I've got a book called Up Your Bottom Line featuring the ABC123 sales results system. So what I've done is I've rebranded that system, ABC123, because it was a simple system on engaging buyers to buy. I've rebranded it to Velocity Selling. Okay, so what happened in the last year or so I realized, you know, the book is, is doing very well and I'm selling a lot of copies, but I wanted to update it. And then I thought about ABC123. When I started, I wanted to keep it really simple, and it's going back 15 years now. So I said, maybe it's time to look at this and, and reposition it. So what I did is a rebranding of the selling system. And then I asked myself, what are the biggest problems in the market today? 
Well, sales, the sales cycles are too long. Um, people's margins and profits are being reduced. Um, salespeople are not really uh, focusing on where they could get what I call the best roadie. Roadie is defined as return on time invested. It's one of the biggest assets we have, and yet no one ever appreciates the value of time. So I look at things as how can I increase the um, effectiveness, return on time in, uh, invested by a salesperson. So we look at different marketing strategies we, where we can attract more buyers. So when I looked at all these pains, uh, the shorter, uh, the lo how long the sales cycles were and everything, I realized my system speeds up the sales process. It shortens your sales cycle. It increases margins, increases revenues. It does not waste salespeople's time, and most importantly, does not waste the client's time. And it's built on a relationship base, but also on involving the customer from the beginning and, of course, having them buy at the end. So when we looked at words, we kind of like I was brainstorming with another individual on branding, and what we did is we brainstormed, and he came up with the word velocity. As he came up with the word velocity, I immediately went to the dictionary and, and looked at the, you know, the, the clearest definition I can get, just basically the speed up of things. It's, it's faster. It helps get things done while maintaining bottom line results, basically. So he kept talking. We kept brainstorming. In the meantime, I'm also searching on websites to see if the name was available and VelocitySelling.com was. So that was how it got started and where it is. Today, anybody that has applied it, they're quite used to the name now. They apply it. And a lot of people are coming back saying it's unbelievable the difference it's made at shortening their sales cycles, increasing their margins, and yet maintaining their best customers, which we call A customers, because you got the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your customers generate 20% of the revenue, but 20% of your customers are generating 80% of the revenue. They are your A clients. We call them absolute because they're absolutely necessary. Without them, you're out of business. And it's usually when you uh, address your marketing to the A and B customers, that's where you get your best return on time invested. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it just is amazing. The 80-20 rule always holds true. Um, yes. And you oh, yeah. have share the same philosophy is that, you know, if you're not moving along the sales process, stop wasting your time. It, it just, yes. It's just annoying to the prospect and it's annoying to management. It's annoying to the salesperson. It's okay for the salesperson to walk away. Um, yeah, and, and, and I give people the tools to set that up so they could walk away. Traditional sales training has always made us comfortable with trying to get the customer to yes. However, we never get yes, we never get no. What we get is think it over or maybe. So what we do is once we establish rapport with the customer, we set some ground rules. And I'll just demonstrate this to you, Michael, and if you can just pretend to be a, a buyer for a moment and just give me whatever answer you want. And I'll just go through a, a quick uh, one-minute scenario here to show you how to set this up. Um, oh, by the way, Mike, how much time do you set us all aside for our call today? Oh, I've got about 20 minutes. Okay. What is it you would like to accomplish in the next 20 minutes? I, I and you can tell me whatever. About, yeah. yeah go ahead. Like learn more about you. I would like to learn more about your company and um, see if there's a possible fit solution. Great, Mike. And I'd like to learn a little bit about your company and also see if there's a possible fit. Is it okay if we ask each other questions? And by the way, I may not be able to help you. I can't solve all the world's problem. If, if, at, if at some point I feel that I can't help you, is it okay if I just say no, no to you? And if I can, I'll say yes. I guess what I'm really saying, Mike, is that could we just work on an honest basis of yes, no answers? Yes. Yeah, okay. Because what I get a lot of time is people say think it over and maybe, and that ends up meaning no, and it ends up wasting your time. And the last thing I want to do is waste your time. Did you want to ask the first question, Mike? And then we carry on well, from there. Yeah, I like that. And I, I like that um, difference is that I'll be asking you questions um, and you can ask me questions because I think yeah, that's the difference. You know. Yeah, you see, the, the guidelines here is, one, find out how much time they have because if you build a good, strong relationship by building a rapport with them, they may give you more time. Number two, Traditional sales training has always told us to have an objective in mind. There's nothing wrong with that, but whose objective is more important, yours or the buyer's? The buyer's. Exactly, because let's face it, if the buyer isn't around, you've got no sale. So we've got to make sure that they are seen as the most important asset here. So then what we do is we, yeah, we, then, ask question, we then ask permission to ask questions, permission to take notes, and then we make them comfortable with no, because if I can't help them, I want to tell them no. 
So then what I do in the next steps, I uncover buying motivators, financial ability, and decision making. And then I summarize. And then I, I have an out now. Mike, from what I understand, you want this, 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 and this. This is what kind of a budget you've got to set aside. You're ready to make a decision. You're the sole decision maker. Is that correct? Yes. Remember earlier I said to you that if I could help you, I would say yes, and if I can't, no. Well, based on what you're telling me, and it could be a budget thing, it could be you don't even have the product or service to help them. You can say, I'm afraid I can't help you. And if you can't help them by referring them, refer them. However, if you can help them, remember earlier I said I'd be honest with you, yes or no? Based on what you're telling me, I do believe I have a solution to your problems within your budget and time frame. I'm prepared to give you that solution now in the form of a, a presentation. Are you still okay with giving me a yes or no answer at the end of my presentation? In other words, why would you want to give a presentation without a commitment up front of what will happen next? And that's one of the key things we teach people is you don't do anything unless you've got a commitment up front of what would happen next. This way you're not wasting anyone's time, and it's honest, it's friendly, it's supportive, and it's different. And it's business-like, too. You're not, you're not trying to force something on someone. It, it, uh, you're being conversational. You're getting the buy-ins along the way, and that's just how it should be. Because it is true, some of our solutions are not for everyone. I mean, it, one size does not fit all. And exactly. You're just you're, you're giving that person a, a comfort, so I like that. Um, yeah, the well, barriers I, come down. And, oh, sorry? Yeah, yeah, no, the barriers come down, absolutely. There, there's no question about it. And plus, you're setting the tone. It's just like anything else. If, if people don't know where you're going, it's very hard to follow. If you tell you got them it. at the end of this meeting, I, I want to go ahead with your business, is that okay? And you tell them that up front, it's just like, you know, Stephen Covey's begin with the end in mind. The same whole. You got it. Itself. Yeah, it's it's really fascinating when it works, um, it, and it, it does work. Um, oh, it does. It just takes time and practice, like anything. Yeah, well, that's it. Practice makes perfect. Um, Bob, um, unfortunately, we're we're out of time, but I've had a lot of fun. Uh, let's just close out with um, some information for the listeners to get a hold of you and, and what you offer. Okay. Well, I guess the first, uh, my main website is uh, www.bobu.com. That's B-O-B-U dot C-O-M. Uh, you can download the uh, white paper there, The New Economy of Buyers. You can also subscribe to our weekly um, e-minute free of charge. And you also have a variety of articles, blogs, and resources there uh, free of charge. Uh, I'm on YouTube with a number of videos. I have uh, magazines, uh, you know, articles published all over the world that's easy to access. So the web, main website is bobu.com. I have two secondary websites, disciplinedforlife.com, where you can download the first three chapters of the book, Disciplined for Life, um, You Are the Author of Your Future. And the other website is upyourbottomline.com, where you can download a free, uh, similar interview that we just did, Mike, um, on audio, and that's available to people. Um, other than that, my email address is just bob at bobu.com. Um, if you have any feedback or any comments on this interview or on any of the materials we provide, please don't hesitate to contact us uh, at, through email. And um, I'm also available toll-free, 1-877-658-8224. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Bob. I really appreciate your time, and I know the listeners have gained a lot of access of knowledge from you, and uh, I wish everyone uh, good luck on your next sales call, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again. Th thanks again, Michael, and have yourself a great week as well. You do the same. Bye now. Bye-bye.